Hi everyone, it's great to be here. Uh, thanks to you know, the situation, we get to pre-record our talks and my wife gets to play with green screens. I'm Amir Tal, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Tabachi Memory Lab at Columbia University. And this is work I did with Professor Ed, Professor Ed Fakir from bar -Ilan University where I did my PhD. It's called How A Priori Biases Affect Sequence Learning in Serial Reaction Time Tasks. Sequence learning is the ability to sequence incoming information and ongoing action. This is a faculty underlying our ability to acquire skilled behavior, from brushing our teeth, to playing a guitar chord, to reciting the alphabet. All these skills require encapsulating a chain of information and actions into one coherent whole. This has been recognized in psychology for a long time, but the method that has become the hallmark for studying sequence learning in the lab is the serial reaction time task, SRT. It's a simple yet very robust paradigm that was introduced in, by Nissan and Bullimore in the late 80s. This is the graph I made of mentions of SRT in Google Scholar over the years, so you get a sense of its popularity in the literature. There are many versions of SRT, but what we did is pretty standard, so I'll show you that. Participants see four white squares on the screen. When a dot appears in any square, they need to press the corresponding arrow key, in this case, up. There's a 500 millisecond interval between target and target, then the next dot appears, and so on. Unbeknownst to participants, targets follow a, se a fixed sequential order of length 12. The order is special in that it's second order conditional, meaning that all elements appear an equal amount of times. And first order transitions are also counterbalanced, so following three, targets one, two, and four appear an equal amount of times. You, so you can't know what comes after three, but you can know what comes after two, three, and that's why it's called second order conditional. This kind of sequence has been shown to be complex enough that even though learning happens, typically uh, participants don't explicitly pick up on it. We form two such sequences, sequence A and sequence B. The experiment is made of six blocks of one sequence, a block is nine conditions of the sequence, then one block of the other sequence, called the interference block, and lastly one final block of the rigid sequence. The typical finding of SRT is that response time drops with practice of the sequence, then rises when the sequence is changed, and then drops back down when it is destroyed, indicating that participants had indeed learned the sequence. Previous work, Eddie Bukid and his lab have tracked participants' gaze during the task and shown that during the ISIs, the 500 milliseconds between target and target, fixations are made more and more towards the location of the upcoming target as participants grow familiar with the sequence. Then, when the sequence changes, the accuracy drops and then restores again on the last block, mirroring findings from response time. In the current work, I want to focus on a question that interested us to explore using this paradigm, the question of a priori biases. It, request, it is a question that has been an interest of mine for a long time because, especially in learning experiments, we examine the end product of practice. And it kind of assumes that participants all begin from the same starting point, that they enter the experiment in Ula Rasa with regard to the stimuli we're about to show them. And that seems a bit of naive. So in this work, we wanted to examine whether, coming into the experiments, participants had predetermined expectations of where targets should appear on screen. And if so, how did that affect their learning? So how do we go about analyzing that? If you look at the stimuli stream of our experiment, it can be broken down into 12 distinct triplets. 2, 3, 1. 3, 1, 2. 2, 4, 1, etc. These 12 interleaved triplets cover the entire stimulus stream of the experiment and predict it completely. These are the second order transitions we mentioned earlier. So to solve, so to speak, the SRT task completely, one only has to learn 12 responses to 12 predictors. Say in the case of 2 and 4, one has to learn that after 2 1 comes the target 4. So for each two repeating stimuli, we looked at where participants fixated during the next ISI. We consider that the participant's response to the two stimuli. In this case, we examine response to all appearances of 2-1. If a participant had indeed learned the 2-1-4 triplet, we'd expect the response to look something like this. At the beginning, she responds for around 25% of the time, as would be expected by chance, because there are four possible responses. But then, with practice, 4 would become the predominant response. There would never be an aha moment, at which point 4 would always be made, because this is implicit, not explicit learning. And the final rate of producing 4 would also not necessarily be 100%. But what's important is whether that response was eventually made in a ratio exceeding chance. 
So it says just that. What is the binomial probability of producing as many consistent responses as the participants have made in the last nine trials, considering there's a chance uh, probability of 25%? Um, if that probability is lower than some statistical benchmark, 0 0.01, we consider the behavior non-random. In this case, the four responses was made, the four response was made seven times out of the nine last encounters of 2 1. And the probability of doing this by chance is 0 0.0013. So we consider this behavior learned. Note that we can do this to test any response we like, whether correct or incorrect, and we indeed do that to find incorrect learning as well. Also, we can use the same logic to find behaviors that participants brought into the experiment with them. Say there's a bias for response 2 after seeing 2 1, we'd expect behavior to look something like this. Even if later on it diminishes, the behavior should be done most of the time at experimental onset, so we can test its significance in the first encounter of the 2 1. In this example, the participant had, to respond, had responded to 2 1 by looking to 2 in 6 out of 9 encounters, and so we deem it a bias. What we get is this kind of raster plot for non-random behaviors, um, which I'll break down a bit. Each row here is a single participant, so there are 68 of those, and each blue square, a non-random behavior that we have identified. On the left are biases, to the right learnings. Um, some participants had sequence A as their main sequence and sequence B as their interference sequence, and some had it the other way around, so that's the two upper rows. And on the bottom you can see 30 additional participants we ran with a random sequence of targets. So these participants did the exact same task with the same lower level statistics of where the targets appear, but there was no fixed sequence that they could learn. Finally, in the leftmost columns are triplets corresponding to sequence A, in the middle, triplets corresponding to sequence B, and on the right, other triplets which belong to neither. When aggregating each cell to the average per participant, the darker the color, the higher the average, a few things stand out. Firstly, as a sanity check, we see that our model does manage to capture learning to a certain extent. Sequence A participants had predominantly learned sequence A triplets, and sequence B participants had predominantly learned sequence B triplets. So mostly, they acquired correct responses. Participants that had no sequence to learn learned sequence A and sequence B triplets just the same. Also, other triplets are far less popular than sequence A and sequence B triplets. This has to do with the test grammar, which we won't go into this talk, but it means that these triplets in include a transition between targets that participants learn very early on. It's not how targets transition, transition in the test. So in this talk, we'll fo focus mostly on comparison between sequence A and sequence B triplets, which is a fair comparison. But we do deal in depth with grammar learning and with learning in general during SRT and other works of ours, including a paper we have just published in Cognition, I highly recommend, which I highly recommend, it's marvelous reading. Um, the focus of this talk is on biases. We found an average of 5.9 biases per participant. That is 5.9 consistent responses at experiment onset. These biases distributed equally between sequence A and sequence B triplets in all participants, so affirming that they had nothing to do with the stimuli we presented them, but were rather a behavior they brought into the experiment with them. How do these biases affect performance? Let's say you have the sequence 214 in your test. How does an a priori tendency to respond to 21 affect learning of 214? A bias could either match the correct response, so the response of 4 in this case, or could conflict with it, respond 1, 2, or 3. When examining anticipation accuracy according to this distinction, it's clear that there would be differences in experiment onset, but what's important is that these initial differences, although they diminish, are still there in block 6. Um, so by the time practice has ended, the performance towards the triplet is still affected by the initial bias the participant had to, happened to have when the experiment began. Roughly half of the triplets have a bias associated with them, and much more are conflicting than matching. And this makes sense because there are three more, there are three ways you can be wrong and only one way you can be right. Six blocks is pretty standard for the SRT paradigm, but nine of our participants underwent prolonged training of 18 blocks. So we checked whether these differences we find would diminish given enough training, and we thank our anonymous COXA reviewers for this suggestion. We find that indeed differences become smaller and smaller with time, but even after 18 blocks, there is still a gap in performance that depends on whether the initial bias happened to be congruent with the triplet. 
So consider, considering the biases are random, and so is the location of a participant to a certain experimental group, we thought it would be interesting to examine how these two interacted to affect our results. For each participant in our study, we counted how many matching biases and how many conflicted biases she had. Giving a point for each matching bias and deducting one for each conflicting bias yielded a score of compatibility to the experiment group. In this example, minus six. Most scores were indeed negative because, as we said before, there are three times more ways to have an incorrect bias than a correct one. We found that this compatibility score was negatively correlated with RT in the final bulk of the experiment. The better you happen to fit the sequence you assigned to you, the better you perform at the end of the experiment. In our experiment, 34% of our subjects would be better off if randomly assigned to the other sequence. So to sum, what did we try to show you? Firstly, there is a general tendency to have a fixed response to simile. When I see 3-1, I look towards 4. Participants tend to converge to the correct behavior, but there is also convergence to incorrect responses. And also, there is consistent biases that are there before any stimuli has been encountered. Biases are prevalent. 49% of prefixes had a consistent behavior associated with them when the experiment began. This underscores the size of the Buddha Rasa assumption we made. Participants aren't a clean slate towards the stimuli we show them. Biases have a long-lasting effect on performance. The particular behavior participants had at the very first trials of the experiment affected their performance at least 648 trials down the line. The takeaway from all this, we feel, is that more thought should be given to participants' starting points. When biases are random, a group assignment is random, these findings shouldn't be a grave consequence because the effects should average out across participants. But two points should be taken into account. Firstly, Bias, biases aren't always independent and indicate in identically distributed. In two studies of artificial grammar learning, for instance, it was found that participants in France did better than their counterparts in Italy on the same material. It was found that the artificial language they used happened to be more similar to French than to Italian. French language biases were better fit than Italian ones, so having these biases put you in a better a priori position to solve the task and gave the experimenter better performance metrics. Secondly, in many cases, what we're interested in is individual capacity, especially in learning paradigms and specifically in SRT, which is used with clinical populations. In these cases, the extent of learning is all that matters. Even if participant A reached worse performance by the end of her experiment than participant B had, what matters is where she began. It takes much more learning to overcome a conflicting bias and then associate it with a new correct response to simply cruise on your biases, which happen to be uh, compatible with the DAC to begin with. And how better to end the talk than with a good metaphor for life? I'd love your questions here in the chat or in private. Thank you. <laughs>